Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were mortgage companies formed by Congress to support the American dream of owning a home. For decades, their influence propelled not only ownership, but also Wall Street greed. They were at the center of the housing crisis. Seven years later, Fannie and Freddie remain in limbo as one of the biggest issues left over from the gloomiest days of the global financial crisis. A new book dissects their rise and fall and what might happen next. It is called Shaky Ground, the strange saga of the U.S. mortgage giants. I'm pleased to be joined by Bethany McLean. Also here, Bill Ackman. He is CEO of the hedge fund Pershing Square Capital Management. I'm pleased to have both of them at the table. So give me a primer. So Fannie and Freddie are these two companies that were formed by Congress, as you mentioned, in the wake of the global financial crisis. The one silver lining was that we might rethink our cult of home ownership and we might figure out what to do with these two companies, what might make more sense. But instead, here we are seven years later. The two companies are still in this state known as conservatorship in which they are effectively supported by a line of credit from the government and um, run by the government. And we've, we've, we've done nothing. Even more frightening, the two companies have, if anything, gotten bigger. They have over $5 trillion of debt backed by home mortgages outstanding. And thanks to a decision by the government, they have no capital to back that up. So in the wake of the crisis, the big discussion about banks has been capital, capital. We need more capital. That's what's going to make our financial system safer. In contrast, we have these two companies, which together are one of the biggest financial com entities in the world mm -hmm. with no capital. And they've been run by people with huge political connections. They have in the past, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. They were run by um, Jim Johnson in the 1990s, who the Washington Post once called the chairman of the universe. And then Frank Raines, and there was talk before he was derailed by an accounting scandal at Fannie Mae that he would be the first black president of the United States. So what happened? What happened was a very simple, relatively safe business uh, that was actually founded, Fannie Mae, uh, right after the Great Depression, to s basically create a market for home mortgages. You know, if you think about the problem with the SNLs, they would take in deposits and make mortgage loans. And in the old days, the banks had to hold on to those mortgages. And if rates went up and down, they could find themselves in, uh, insolvent by virtue of uh, having lent money on a long-term basis at a fixed rate. and. Uh, having deposits that you know change in price uh, every day and really what Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have done is create liquidity for mortgages and enabled the establishment of a 30-year prepayable fixed rate mortgage which became a fixture uh, of the housing market and that business the, their business was basically buying up mortgages from banks getting up a large enough volume of them and then selling securities backed by those mortgages Oops. where they where they would guarantee the payment of interest in principle so yeah. very simply they would buy a bunch of mortgages chop them up in little pieces and sell bonds backed by those obligations. And they were in the insurance business, and they would guarantee the payment of interest and principal on these mortgages over 30 years. And it made these securities very safe, and it made them securities that would be, for you know, every bank in the world owns Fannie and Freddie mortgages. Every sovereign wealth fund around the world owns these uh, securities. And that was kind of the safe business. What went wrong was they Have went off the road. Have you owned any of these securities? Uh, I've never owned a Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac mortgage. Uh, I today am a shareholder of both companies, uh, companies in conservatorship. Uh, but just to carry it forward, uh, that very safe business of guaranteeing the timely payment of interest in principal on first mortgages to middle class borrowers, um, the management teams decided to get a little more aggressive. And they went into businesses they shouldn't be in, you know, hedge fund like businesses, uh, businesses of betting on the prices of securities and arbitraging their ability to issue debt. And then they were pressed by Congress uh, to make riskier and riskier, guarantee riskier and riskier loans. Uh, so more and more people could own a home. So more and more people could own a home. So Fannie Mae wanted something from Congress, that is the ability to go into riskier businesses, I mean, uh, borrow money and buy securities. And the Barney Franks of the world wanted them to, to guarantee riskier mortgages. And that combination was a bad recipe going into the financial crisis. And when home prices declined, these entities became insolvent fairly quickly, and the government took them I remember a story, and it's sort of, I'm, no, I'm not sure either of you have heard this story, but Larry Summers was on a shuttle, mm -hmm. uh, and he it was just at the end of the Clinton administration, and he ran into somebody who was part of the incoming administration, and he basically said, uh, the Bush 43 administration, and he said, the most important thing you can do is fix Fannie Mae mm -hmm. and Freddie Mac. 
that's the most important thing you can do. One of the really interesting things is that these companies are widely perceived as democratic companies, but it yeah. was actually under the Clinton administration that Larry Summers, Treasury, first took them on yeah. in an official way back in the 1990s and took began them on, took them on, meaning Summers began to criticize them publicly and question the U.S. government's ties to these companies, therefore weakening them. And it became a huge political brouhaha in Washington back in the late 90s. But I think it's fascinating that it was a Democratic Treasury Secretary who first started trying to reduce their power. So what are you going to do? What's the solution? The solution, we think, is actually to restore Fannie and Freddie to what they were 30 and 40 years ago, which was very safe businesses guaranteeing the timely payment of interest and principal. And why is that important? The U.S. economy is really the only housing finance market in the world where you can borrow money for 30 years at a fixed rate. And you can borrow 80% of the value of a home. And that ability to borrow 80% of the value of home at a very low fixed rate, today you can borrow money at you know, something less than 4% on a first mortgage on a $250,000 home, is what enabled, it really enables the American dream of owning a home, in effect, a very good way to save for retirement. I mean, that simple model is what we need to go back to. And How do we get back there? The way we get back there is, uh, so what's happened here is both companies were taken over because they took risks they shouldn't have taken. They didn't have enough capital. Uh, the current management teams, which are not part of the political management teams of the past, have done a very good job running both companies since the crisis, rebuilding the capital of both companies. And really, the, the, the issue they were headed back in the right direction, which is getting out of the risky businesses, guaranteeing you know, good, strong credit quality mortgages. Uh, and then in August of 2012, the U.S. government decided sort of unilaterally to basically take 100% of the, actually take 100% of the profits of both companies forever. So every quarter that Fannie and Freddie generate profits, uh, which has been every quarter basically since uh, 2012, the U.S. government takes out all of the capital institution as a dividend uh, and deprives the entity of an ability to recapitalize. And what should happen is, number one, those dividends should stop. Uh, the government's been repaid $240 billion of the original 150 billion of principal they injected into these entities. So the U.S. government made a very large profit, almost $100 billion profit on the takeover, which it should. The U.S. government and the taxpayers own 79.9% of these two companies, so there's a big opportunity for enrichment for the taxpayer. But they should allow the entities to rebuild their capital. They should not pay any dividends until they get to a level of capital that Jamie Dimon would call a fortress balance sheet. Yeah. And the U.S. government should get out of the business of owning a housing housing finance company, you know, very much like the banks. If you think about Citigroup during the crisis, the U.S. government did the same thing they did to Fannie, which is they injected capital to bolster the institution. They took warrants, which is a uh, participation in the stock in exchange for uh, committing capital, and they forced Citigroup to rebuild its capital base. They got Citigroup to exit businesses they shouldn't be in, kind of the higher risk businesses. And the U.S. government sold down its position, the taxpayer exited at a profit, and it was restored to a privately held institution. That same thing happened at AIG. Mm -hmm. uh, the same thing happened at J.P. Morgan, uh, Goldman Sachs, B of A. Interestingly, Fannie and Freddie were the only institutions where the government decided after the crisis, four years later, to take, basically take 100% of the profits forever. So it's a unique uh, event in the history of, of corporate America. Speaking of AIG, what did you think of the Hank Greenberg suit and, and victory, even though there was no money involved? Sure. What's interesting about that is Hank was suing... By Explain the way, to people what he did. So basically, AIG was rescued like Fannie and Freddie. The government injected $100-plus billion of capital like Fannie and Freddie on very onerous terms, you know, high coupon. They took a 79 They pretty much got what they wanted. The government took a huge pound of flesh out of AIG, and then AIG sold off businesses, paid back that money, and became a public company again, which is what we expect to happen, which should happen with Fannie and Freddie. Now... Uh, Hank Green, he was not happy with the terms of the bailout, and he sued, saying this was really an illegal expropriation. And when he sued, nobody thought he had a chance of a, and, uh, either, either a legal or a financial victory. And he won, but ultimately got no damages, right. which is sort of a pyrrhic victory. But what's interesting here is we're not, we, by the way, my position here is we are shareholders of Fannie and Freddie, and we are suing the U.S. government on behalf of all of the common stockholders and preferred stockholders uh, to reverse this 2012 transaction. We are not fighting the original bailout. So Hank attacked the 2008 takeover the of AIG of and the terms. Right. We're saying those terms are onerous, but we can accept those terms. What we're objecting to is four years after the crisis, it wasn't enough for the government to get a 10% coupon, get their money back, and own 80% of both companies. The government decided to take the remaining 20%. When you say we, you mean 
you on, on behalf of millions of shareholders. Millions Fannie and Freddie, we've got we get calls, we get emails, we get letters from you know people in retirement who own so five thousand, ten thousand shares of these companies. What's in it for you? What's in it for us is I manage a fund. Our investors uh, benefit if the stock price increases, uh, and you know that's how we make a living. What do you think that is? Well, I think that the U.S. government needs to do something about the Fannie and Freddie situation. I think every person out there should care about this because it isn't just homeowners with mortgages who are impacted. It's investors. It's our relationship with global entities, global foreign banks who own big chunks of these securities. But these, these securities are like water. They move through the global financial system. And if there's a disruption and Fannie and Freddie suffer big losses again and have to take billions of dollars from taxpayers, there could be a disruption in all of these, all of these markets. So I, I, want, I want a solution. I'm a little less sanguine than Bill that there is necessarily a big payoff for investors in this, but I've come to believe that despite all the problems with Fannie and Freddie's business model, it's a little bit like Winston Churchill's old quote about democracy, mm -hmm. you know, the worst thing in the world with the possible exception of all, everything else yeah. that's been proposed, and I still have not heard an idea when you really start to think through what's, what's the alternative. They're all worse. Uh, President Obama described the dysfunctional business model of Fannie and Freddie as heads we win, tails you lose. That can be fixed. That's really yeah. just an issue of capital, right? If you think of the banking system in this country, the major banks, they all have a f explicit guarantees from the U.S. government, right? Every major bank, the depositors have a guarantee from the U.S. government. That's a huge subsidy of the banking system. Every bank, every large bank has the potential for the government to step in and save it if there's a financial crisis. There's a bit of an implicit backstop behind every major financial institution. Well, what, what has the government decided to do to address that problem? They're forcing the banks to hold more capital. And what we believe is that Fannie and Freddie, are, have their, we put guardrails on them. We stop them from going into the high-risk businesses right. that put them off the ledge. We require them to hold multiples of the capital they required to hold in the past. You can make it extremely remote that the taxpayer ever has to step in and save both companies. Mm -hmm. And the good news is that if you let Fannie and Freddie recapitalize by just generating, just with the profits they're generating, in four or five years we believe they'll be worth something like a half a trillion dollars. The taxpayer will own 80% of both companies, so there's $400 billion of common stock owned by the taxpayer that can be used for education, infrastructure, deficit reduction, uh, if you let these entities continue to exist. And there really is no viable alternative to Fannie and Freddie, and that's why they still exist where they are. The problem is you've got the largest, this is the largest financial institution in the world if you combine them, uh, operating with zero capital, because each quarter the government takes out, sweeps out 100% of the profits. And so is there's this nothing the to remaining tell. big issue with respect to the 2008 this crisis. This is the, yes. the only piece of unfinished business. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine if J.P. Morgan were operating every quarter with no capital? So if they suffered a loss, they were they were done for. They had to get a bailout. And if or they, they made a profit, they had to give it over. If, to they get, else. if they made a profit, they had to hand it over to the government. Mm -hmm. uh, Bill had a great line for what this is yesterday, but I'll let you say it. What was it? I don't even remember. <laughs> you called it Stalinesque. Uh, Stalinesque. Yeah, well, State it's, control. I mean, no, it's literally the the 2012 transaction is literally a the government. But taking private property without compensation. You know, that's, you know, constitutional stuff. So what did you think of Dodd-Frank? Um, look, I, what's interesting is I think the original uh, securities laws that were put in place after the Great Depression were really good. Uh, the issue was more an issue of enforcement of the law than we needing more laws. Uh, you know, I've actually, I read the Dodd-Frank bill when it, when it came out in the whatever thousand plus uh, you, you pages. You had a free week, did you? <laughs> but the, the, problem with, <laughs> yeah. the problem with uh, bills and laws that are thousands of pages um, is you know, there's enormous complexity. I, I would not want to be Jamie Dimon. I would not want to be Ryan Moynihan running a major financial okay, institution. Okay, so, so the laws are com complex, but it also are the standards of liquidity and leverage uh, reasonable? What I would say is the banking system is a vastly better place than it was uh, 10 years ago. But there's and no so that's a positive. Point. And, and if the, those standards had been in place in 2007 and 8, mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have had the crisis? I think, uh, I think we would be less likely to have the crisis. Lehman Brothers would have been less but the, likely But the to basic principles you don't need a thousand pages for. Hold yeah. more capital, exit risky businesses. The problem but with Dodd-Frank is the complexity and the regulatory overlap right. of all the different institutions and it leads to some. It can lead to some bad. And they could have basically said this is sort of almost a kind of go back to where we were in terms of what you can do and what you can't do. The, the, you know, the, after the Great Depression, there was a big backlash. The SEC was basically created and introduced. A lot of good law was put into place. And the problem is, you know, we, seventy years went by and, and people stopped enforcing the rules. This will not. Be, go ahead. 
I was going to say, there's an important point about Dodd-Frank because everybody pretends that there's this alternative to Fannie and Freddie, which is get the government out of the housing market. Let's have private money finance housing. Why do you need the government involved? Well, that private money is the big banks. And so despite what Dodd-Frank does, and despite the argument that Dodd-Frank now prevents this issue of too big to fail and makes it so that the big banks can fail. If you take all the mortgage risk in the country and put it into the banking system, those banks cannot be allowed to fail. So it effectively undoes Dodd-Frank and just is a different version of having a government-backed housing system. It's not private capital in the way that there's this pretense that it would be. You see, I, I agree so. that you want the housing finance system supported only by private capital, but the what, you can't do that de novo with a blank sheet of paper and build a business from scratch. What you can do is take Fannie and Freddie that have been around for case of Fannie Mae since 1935, in case of Freddie Mac since the, you know, I think the late 60s. You can take these entities that now have enormous scale and scale economies and a track record and experience and geographical diversification, and you can make them public companies again, owned by the public. And as long as the capital base is large enough, you can make it extremely unlikely the government or the taxpayer is, has to be involved in housing. The government's involvement should be regulation mm -hmm. and oversight, not risking taxpayer money on housing. And you can get there with the current system. Does any other country in the world have a system like we do? No other country has a system like we do, and there's no other country besides tiny Denmark that has what Americans have come to think of as a birthright, which is a 30-year fixed rate, fully prepayable mortgage. That's enabled by our, by our system. You will hear this argument, well, other countries do it differently, and their rates of home ownership are better than ours. Why can't we do it differently? There are two problems with that. One is that other countries aren't as diverse geographically or in terms of the income spreads as, as, as we are. The other is that in Europe, banks essentially financed the housing market there. When the crisis came in 2008, Europe had to bail out its banks. So again, there's this idea that other companies don't have the government involved, but when a crisis hits, the government's involved. Actually, if I could just mention, Bethany talked about this 30-year mortgage. Why don't we just get rid of the 30-year mortgage? The problem with that is the entire, uh, the bulwark of the housing system in the United States is a 30-year mortgage. It's what enables someone who's 28 years old, 32 years old, you know, save some money to put down a down payment, to buy a home and know that they don't have to, they're not going to get stuck in five years having to refinance an obligation that comes due. They've got 30 years where they can pay off a mortgage, and if rates decline, they can refinance at a lower rate. And it's, 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 you know, that instrument has created enormous wealth in the country, and it supports the value of the housing market. If you get rid of the 30-year prepayable mortgage, which no one is actually in favor of in the Congress that I've heard of, you destroy the housing market and the economy with it. Last winter, you said that, that, that Freddie Mae and Fannie Mae, Freddie Mae and Freddie Mac were the most interesting risk reward that I'm aware of in the capital markets now. Mm -hmm. What I mean by that is, if you buy the common stock today, I believe the only solution to the problem is for these entities to be effectively privatized again. And in that scenario, the investors in Fannie and Freddie do very, very well. Now, the good news is the well, taxpayer... Do, 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 do you believe that that, in fact, will be the solution that takes place? Yes. And, and, and you believe it's a safe bet to bet on that idea? I don't want to make a, a, an investment recommendation. I'm, I'm not asking you to investment recommendation. I'm asking about you in terms of The way of we think about it do. is it's a very attractive risk reward. I think that it's much more likely than not that that's the outcome. Um, but you've got political risk. Yeah. You've got legal risk. You've got regulatory risk, you've got leverage, you've got a lot of complexity, and so therefore I would not call it a safe bet. I think it's a very interesting one. I'm a little less sanguine than Bill on this topic. Uh, I think it's a great example of political dysfunction in Washington that we haven't done anything yet. And I'm not as optimistic that our political system is going to do anything until there's a crisis. And my fear is that if there is a crisis, the government will lurch and will end up with, instead of a responsibly thought out, carefully planned system, will lurch to some sort of solution that may not be a, a solution at all. So I wish the government would take the luxury of fixing the roof while the sun is shining mm -hmm. and do something while the market seems relatively steady to put us on stable ground for the next bunch of decades instead of waiting until there's a crisis and hitting the panic button. Let me talk about the economic health of financial institutions. Big banks are doing Big banks, I think, are doing decently well. It's going to be interesting to see what the Federal Reserve's actions are yeah. mean 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 for the, mean for the health of big banks. They'll I take think, place tomorrow. Yep, and I think there's a lot of um, I think there's a lot of questions about what their business model is going to be going going forward. Big, big banks. Mm -hmm. Big banks. And what businesses they're in. And what businesses they're in, and whether the trading businesses can ever make as much money as they did as they did in the future as they did in the past. I'm sorry. Explain to us why it matters to most Americans whether the Federal Reserve raises the interest rates or not. 
Well, tomorrow it's sort of an indication of what the Federal Reserve thinks of the state of the economy. Right. right? If they defer the decision to raise rates it again, means they're still worried. Means they still have concern. Right. Uh, actually, part of me says a, a small increase in rates would be viewed quite favorably. Uh, by the investment community. Because it's basically market. saying that the, the, the government, you know, the Federal Reserve believes that the economic you know, strength of the economy is such that it, we can, I mean, again, a 25 basis point increase in rates is not material in any way, but it sends a message that we're now beginning to, you know, we finally have recovered from the crisis, which I think is a positive. Uh, Actually, we, we're here to talk about a book. Let me make one little recommendation. I didn't write it, so I can give it a little more objectivity. This what? is quite a good book. Okay. Uh, and what half the problem with Fannie and Freddie yes. is that no one in the Congress and the government, probably in the country, very few people understand what these institutions do, what happened, etc. This is a little book. It takes two hours to read. Which is where we began. It costs 11 bucks. It's probably the best $11 you'll spend. So I'll give a little plug for Bethany. There you Sample. go. Thank you, Beth. You'll take all the plugs you can. I will absolutely take yeah. all the plugs I can. It's a, it's a tough topic, you know. It's funny because these yeah, but two... but you tackle tough financial topics all the time. Mm, thank you. These two companies make up so much of the machinery of our lives. You know, they are part of almost every American's daily lives, even though people don't, don't realize it. And I feel like it's something we should understand and think about instead of just letting its special interests in Washington dictate the outcome without anybody understanding what's really happening until there's another crisis and then everybody will say, why weren't why why didn't we do yeah. things differently? Well, let me go back to my question. Started with big banks. What about hedge funds? I mean, there's been a real examination of the success of hedge funds and questioning of hedge funds. I think it's like any and other. profitability has slipped dramatically. As, and, and you you're one of the shining stars. I think. But even you had a bad month in August. Bad month in August. Yeah. Well, fortunately, we don't <laughs> judge ourselves on a monthly basis, and hopefully, our investors don't do the same. So uh, why did you have a bad month in August? We own. Great businesses, the stock market dropped a uh, meaningful amount, and you know, in the short term, even great business, you know, even Berkshire Hathaway is going to, you know, Buffett stock is down a lot. You know why? You know, people panic, they sell stocks, um, but it's not. You know, what our business is owning assets that will increase in value on a long term basis, and in the short term, the stock market moves up and down. But aren't a lot of uh, pension funds getting out of investing in hedge? Actually, in probably, hedge the, probably the opposite. Is direction. it really? They're moving in. Yeah, but it's, some are like. I'm just Cal, uh, Calpers, Calpers I'm exited. Look, I think, but I mean, is they, are they alone in terms of that? I don't think of hedge funds as an asset class. It's a, a hedge fund is basically a manager who gets a compensation structure which includes a percentage of the profits. As a result of that profit share, it attracts a lot of people uh, to the industry. But th there are hedge funds that bet on commodities. Wait, oh, wait, wait stop there, because I mean, you, you're saying it also gets a percentage of for for managing the assets too. That's correct. It's a very profitable business model, and therefore it attracts people who, you know, want to compete in this industry. Um, but there's a, a full continuum of, of talent in the industry. But is it changing? Uh, it's changed only so far as this was a boutique. You know, 25 years ago, you know, hedge funds were small. There were you know, a couple hundred. Uh, the amount of capital managed was very small. Today, it's a couple trillion dollars of capital, and hedge fund managers tend to be tend to be, this is not all, you know, we, we take a much longer term approach, much more short term oriented, yeah. tend to be more trend following, but these are trends. Uh, trend tend to be more traders. Yeah. If I, if I may, I don't, I get just to make one very high level point about, uh, you know, let's talk that about the middle class for the moment, okay, sure. as it relates to uh, what Bethany's written about. What's interesting, if you think about the last 10 or 20 years, the price of almost the, the common things that people need, so the price of clothing, the price of fuel, the price of computing. Uh, the price of basic goods and services for your middle class, working class person has actually come down meaningfully, right? We've had a meaningful deflation in the price of most things you need to, to live a good life. And I think that's partly why, even though there's been no, very little real wage increases, people have not been, there hasn't been a, a revolution, right, mm -hmm. despite that. Um, the risk, however, is really, the, the only asset I think is at risk of really appreciating dramatically over the next 10 or 20 years where the middle class gets left behind is the roof over your head. Uh, mm -hmm. Because if you don't own a home, you're subject to renting an apartment, and rents yeah. have been increasing at very high rates, you know, five, six, seven yeah. percent per annum. And so the, the ability to own a home and control your cost of housing for the next 30 years or until retirement and actually build a nest egg with this asset uh, is, is a very important thing. That's why, you know, when, why is Fannie and Freddie important? Fannie and Freddie have enabled people to own homes in America, and that's why this is such and an important issue. 
And then, uh, okay, go ahead. I was going to say this ties into your question about about hedge funds, though. It's it's an interesting thing because there are other hedge funds like Bell's who are suing the U.S. government over their handling of Fannie and Freddie. And the frequent criticism is, well, these guys are just out to line their own pockets. They're just out for investors. But if you think about it in a different way, it takes someone with a lot of money and a lot of power to sue the U.S. government. And I think it's fantastic that we have a group of people who are willing to shine a light on the government's actions. I applauded Hank Greenberg for bringing his AI suit because you know what the government's actions in a time of crisis should be scrutinized and the government's actions after a crisis has passed should 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 the be more scrutinized came out, the more and this and, began to realize that there was a case and there. I think that could be the case in this in, in this as well but that's actually a value the transparency that hedge funds wealthy investors can provide is actually a huge value I think not not some bad thing that we should be seeking to get rid of is a carried interest deduction a huge value for that <laughs> well that's a different topic and that one we could, that one that one I might come down on, on a different on a different side on <laughs> yeah. but I mean I remember when after in in the as we began to deal with the crisis I mean every smart people would come to this table and they would say the indicator I'm looking for is for the housing market to regain its growth when we began to see movement in new construction mm -hmm. then I'll know that the economy is beginning to to gain traction. I, mean, I think those are some of the indicators the Federal Reserve is looking at, uh, Janet Yellen is looking right. at and deciding on rates. I think, you know, the housing market is a huge part of the economy, right? You think it's not just home construction, but it's the furniture you buy, it's the moving, uh, you know, and also it's one of the few places where a middle class person today can make a real living in construction without a college education, right? right. right? And so construction is very important for the, for, the, for the economy generally. But is the idea that, you know, invest in your home because it will always get better, it will always grow, uh, that equity will always be higher than it is what you invested, is that idea dead? You certainly don't, it's certainly not dead, and I would say since the financial crisis went, you know, you, you had a kind of stable increase in the value of homes around the country over a 75-year period of time. And then you had a massive acceleration in the value of homes in a several-year period of time, fueled by basically no money down, crazy forms of financing. And that blew up because it was a bubble. And then the whole housing market reset at a much lower value. And I think the benefit of becoming a homeowner today is you're buying in at much lower cost. And I think it will be a good investment like it has been in the past over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years, unlike the stock market you know, where people react emotionally to their stocks going up and down and they often sell at the wrong time. The beauty of a home is at a minimum you have an asset you can live in. You know the cost of what you, and in the meantime you can rebuild equity as you, you have a, almost a kind of built-in savings plan as your mortgage bill comes in and you pay a little bit of principal each month. It's a very good way for the average person to put away money for retirement. You're a financial writer and not an economist, I think. That uh, is correct. What's the impact of what's going on in China? I mean, what, what impact are we looking to unfold in, in the um, economic, global economy because of China's slowing down of growth and, and real efforts on that government to try to do something? Uh, even some people judge you know, too much. Right. I think it's a big risk, and I think it's a big overhang for the global economy, just how bad is the situation in China. And there have been some very smart people who have argued over the years that the situation is quite a bit worse than anybody wants to let, let on, that the numbers are not necessarily true, and that they, if we had a meltdown fueled by a real estate boom in 2008, they're going to have a meltdown fueled by an unsustainable real estate and construction boom, the likes of which the world has, has never seen. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a big risk for the global economy for the global economy you're already seeing it obviously in, in commodity prices and it's 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 frightening it's 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 an overhang you know the, there's it's nice to believe that the economic world we live in is secure after the global financial crisis but it it's still a scary place you in some ways. I have a pretty I'm, you know pretty bearish view on China I think the, the stated growth rate of seven percent I think is is overstated uh, I think it's a very leveraged economy um, I, I think the Chinese did not handle their both the rapid increase in the stock market and promoting margin leverage, encouraging, re encouraging retail investors to invest. And I think the... Going after financial writers. And then the, <laughs> then the subsequent collapse, you, know, you have the stock market's down 35, 40 percent, and the, and the Chinese approach has been to literally arrest and attack and go after everything from short sellers to anyone who sold a stock. Um, you know, there's nothing more frightening to an investor to be in a market where the stock market's down 35 percent and you're told you're not allowed to sell. And so I just think the, yeah, that's a bad place you know, look, I have enormous respect for the Chinese. This is an incredibly entrepreneurial, intelligent uh, people. And, and um, a huge economy. 
and a huge economy. Uh, it's very important for the global economy. But I think they really mishandled the stock market. And uh, they're, right now, they're trying to manage their currency and manage their economy. And that's a very difficult thing to do. Right. Um, and and so by the way, they are a big owner not only of U.S. Treasuries, but also of Fannie and Freddie yeah. mortgage-backed securities. Are, are they selling some of those U.S. securities? I don't think they're selling yet. Yeah. Bill, do you know the answer to that? I think it's a threat. It's well, an overhang. I, think, well, they, 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 I don't know. They, I mean, I, my impression was they were. They, they, there's an enormous amount better. of pressure both, on, the, on the Chinese currency. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So you have you know, Chinese people who are trying to get their capital out of the country. Uh, you have an economy that's deteriorating. There's, I think, an expectation on the part of investors that the Chinese will have to let their currency depreciate. So in order to counteract that, what they're doing is they're well, selling. They're they're going to do that, they? Well, they, you know, two percent de yeah. uh, depreciation, which is nothing. I think it probably needs to be twenty or thirty percent. But the uh, the response to that basically is selling U.S. dollar assets, um, probably Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac securities, U.S. Treasuries, and buying uh, the Chinese yuan in order to support the currency. And they are consuming their financial reserves doing that. Uh, I get the impression that, that you're here to, because of your strong feelings about Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, and not to talk about Pershing Square. I'm happy to. Uh, happy to talk about Pershing Square. But, but we wanted to focus on this. But where is the Herbalife deal? So uh, since I was on your show, which was quite a while ago when yes. the topic came up, uh, since Just that explain time. Explain to him what the deal is. Short story here is uh, we have a short story. Short story. story. Yes. Yes. No pun short story. Yeah, no pun intended. It's really a short story. <laughs> Bethany is a well known, among other things, for exposing the Enron uh, fraud. Yeah. But, a, a, an amazing book. But uh, we have a short position in a company called Herbalife. Herbalife is a New York stock exchange company that we believe has been operating a pyramid scheme now for right. 35 years, which is a kind of an incredible fact. Uh, it's a company that, uh, as a result of our publicity around the company, shining a spotlight on the business, numerous public presentations we've made, um, the FTC has launched a formal investigation. The Department of Justice has launched a formal investigation. Probably six or seven attorneys general have ongoing investigations. And the SEC has an investigation. I think the frustration on the part of investors, actually, um, and actually the media, Joe Nacero wrote a very important column uh, where he contacted the Federal Trade Commission. Former co-author. Yeah, former co-author. <laughs> he contacted the FTC uh, in the last uh, two days, and he said, you know, look, you just shut down a pyramid scheme called Vima, uh, which is, you know, many Herbalife distributors left Herbalife at the time of our presentation and went to Vima, another pyramid scheme. You shut down Vima, yet Herbalife is still around. Please tell me what's the difference between Herbalife and Vima, and what is defined for me a pyramid scheme, which should be, you know, again, for the Federal Trade Commission, which is... Uh, responsible for protecting consumers from pyramid schemes, they should be able to tell a, an important reporter for the New York Times what a pyramid scheme is. They refused to answer the question on the record. Mm -hmm. They said, I'm sorry, we have no answer for you, is what he said in the, in the article. So I think the problem we have is, whether it's a legislative problem or the FTC is not a, a strong regulator as it should be, uh, you know, this company needs to be shut down. Uh, it is effectively identical uh, and substantively to the com smaller companies they've shut down. Uh, and I think it'll eventually will happen. If it's back shut down, it'll be a huge payday for you? Uh, our investors will make a lot of money. Uh, I've committed to give away 100% of any profits I make personally, um, but it will be good for my investors and good for my funds, for sure. Thank you for coming. Thanks for having Great me. to see you guys. Other than at tennis tournaments. Uh, shaky ground, the strange saga of the U.S. mortgage giants, uh, Freddie Mae and Fannie Mac. Bethany, thank you. Thank Great you. Great to see you.